Assalamu alaikum. So this is the uh, third lecture of the second topic, enzyme-based molecular techniques. And uh, we're going to talk about a number of techniques related to analysis of gene expression via measuring the levels of RNA. Now, in the previous course, we talked about basic techniques like northern blotting and in situ hybridization. <clears throat> and we said that, well, with northern blotting, we can know, we can tell the relative expression of a gene uh, by knowing, by looking at the thickness of the RNA band. If you remember that, we, uh, we can also know the size of the messenger RNA as well. Okay. Now, with inside to hybridization, we can tell again relatively the expression of a certain gene by staining RNA molecules and uh, in, in a tissue section. And we can also know the location of, of where this expression takes place, that is, in what cells in a tissue section. Now, Right now, we'll talk about three techniques, and these three techniques, one of them, uh, well, two of them are advanced, and one of them is really advanced. It's the, the, the latest, you can say. Uh, it all starts by making complementary DNA, or cDNA, from a messenger RNA. So the idea here, if you remember again, that the messenger RNA is modified by adding a poly A tail. So what we can do is we can convert it to DNA, and we call it complementary DNA, using a primer, uh, an oligo uh, deoxy T, okay, and let's see, uh, an oligo deoxy T, and this oligo deoxy T would bind to the poly A tail, and then the reverse transcriptase would make the first strand of DNA using the messenger RNA as a template. Then the uh, reverse transcriptase as well, what it does is that it digests, it degrades the messenger RNA and it synthesizes the second strand. So it goes backward again. Now we have double stranded DNA. Now notice something that is really important here. The ratio between messenger RNA and its cDNA is one to one. In other words, if there are 10 copies of messenger RNA in a cell, you make 10 copies of cDNA in the test tube, okay? If there are 100 copies of messenger RNA, you have 100 copies of complementary DNA, cDNA. If you have 1,000, you have 1,000 as well, okay? So the ratio is one to one. We do, that's the first technique, we do a PCR reaction of the cDNA, okay, so quote unquote, that is the messenger RNA, in other words, and it is, it can be quantitative, meaning that you can quantify the number of, um, number of molecules of cDNA slash messenger RNA using real-time PCR. We talked about real-time PCR before when we discussed PCR. And I said that uh, one of the basic techniques is using cyber green, okay? And cyber green, as I said, it's a chemical, a small chemical that binds to double-stranded DNA. And when it binds to double-stranded DNA, it fluoresces. And the more DNA there is in a sample, the more fluorescent there would be, right? Great. So the thing is, uh, what we do is that we convert, we, we isolate the messenger RNA molecules from, a, from cells or from a sample, and we convert these messenger RNA molecules to cDNA, okay? And then we take this cDNA and we amplify it. So we're, what we're doing is that we are amplifying specific genes using specific primers for these genes, okay? So... And then we quantify the amount or the, the, the fluorescence that is generated after each cycle. So here's an example right here, okay? We have different samples, we have five samples. And remember when I said that uh, in the early cycles, there is nothing detected, not because there is no 
amplification of cDNA. No, there is amplification, except that the instrument is not sensitive enough to detect very low amount of, um, of molecule of cDNA. But it doubles uh, with every cycle, right? So let's say here that we have different samples. Here we have one copy of messenger RNA or slash cDNA and up to 10,000 copies of uh, cDNA molecules. And let's say that the, the limit of detection is 100,000 copies, okay, something like that. So the thing is, all of them would be amplified. So one would become two after a cycle, two would become four, then eight, then 16, and so on. 10 would be doubled to 20, then 40, then 80, then 160. Same thing here, 100 to 200 to 400 to 800, 1600, and so on, okay? Same thing, until they reach the level of, I don't know, let's say it's, a, it's an arbitrary number. Let's say 100,000 copies, then it can be detected. Now, the one with the starting number of uh, copies of cDNA, uh, 10,000 copies of cDNA would be detected first because it would reach the 100,000 copies early on, the first one. So at cycle, let's say um, uh, 12, 13, whatever, now we start to see detection for the first sample. Then we see the second sample, then the third sample, the fourth and so on. Now, the one copy, that the sample with one copy of cDNA as a starting material would eventually be detected, right? But later on, uh, in, in, the, in terms of number of cycles. So we would know that this sample here contains more starting material. The black sample ha contains more starting material than the blue sam sample and the, the uh, or cyan sample. The uh, cyan sample or blue contains more starting material than, than the green sample and so on. So the thing is, we, we tell, we can tell that uh, the black sample, for example, has more gene expression of, a per, of this particular gene that we are testing, that we are amplifying, right? And this sample right here, the second sample, has the second highest level of messenger RNA slash cDNA, right? And so on. So we can quantify uh, exactly the number of copies, or we can at least know relatively which sample has more messenger RNA molecules as starting material than other samples and so on, right? So that's the idea of real-time PCR of messenger RNA or cDNA. Now, remember last semester when I talked about housekeeping genes and I said a housekeeping gene is a gene that is needed uh, to be expressed by by cells all the time and its level is not different uh, according to the environment that that cells live in right uh, and i gave you examples of housekeeping genes like actin for example all cells need actin all the time uh, and there are other examples like tubulin so all cells need tubulin all the time as well okay uh, tubulin makes uh, microtubules so so we talked about these housekeeping genes and I said that we use them, we have to, to use them to make sure, like in northern blotting, we have to use them to make sure that the amount of starting material that I'm using for different samples would be the same in terms of how much housekeeping gene there is or the, in terms of expression of housekeeping genes, right? Why? Because it should not change. And that gives me sort of like a uh, comfort in, in terms of the starting material that I'm using for samples that I want to compare to each other. Okay, so the thing is, the, if, when, when I try to do real-time PCR using two different samples to look at the relative expression of a certain gene, I have to do a house. Uh, I have to do analysis of the level of a housekeeping gene, expression of a housekeeping gene. Okay, again, like actin and, and tubulin and whatever. Why? 
just to make sure that this, that I'm starting with a with the same or at least similar amount of total R in A. Okay, so let's say that I'm, for example, one I'm using uh, a um, an, a concentration of one microgram of RNA as a starting material, and for the other sample, I'm using 10 micrograms. Well, this is really a huge difference, right? So, so I'm gonna see that the the gene that I'm analyzing uh, for for its expression, the one with the 10 micrograms of total RNA would this gene would appear early on by real-time PCR. But this is an artifact. It is not an accurate assessment, right? Why? Because I'm using a different uh, uh, total amount of RNA. So, but if I'm using one microgram of one sample and one microgram of the other sample, well, I have to look at again the expression of a housekeeping gene just to make sure that they are equal uh, uh, to each other so uh, okay so so by looking at the the expression of a housekeeping gene i know that i'm using equal amounts of total rna <coughs> okay so by doing real-time pcr of one housekeeping gene and in this case this is a uh, this is a ribosomal protein, which uh, again, its expression should not change uh, according to condition. Okay. And notice for two samples right here, dark uh, blue and 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 uh, light blue, that the detection. So this is real time PCR of uh, of messenger RNA or cDNA. Okay now, so there are different technologies and it all started with, uh, with an analysis of DNA and analysis of uh, the genome. So the word genome means uh, the total collection of DNA in a cell, the whole genome. I'm looking at everything, okay? Um, but all cells have really the same um, DNA, right? And same genes as well. So by looking at what genes are important for what cells, we have to look at the messenger RNA. Another name for messenger RNA is transcript. So a messenger RNA is a transcript. Okay? So scientists who um, came up with, with the, the term genome um, well, and they came up with the science on genomics. So scientists who started to study transcripts or messenger RNA molecules said, you know what? Um, you have genome, we have transcriptome. So they started a new term and it's known as transcriptome. And the whole science is known as transcriptomics. Okay, now like genomics. Now, by the way, protein biochemists said, you know what, what's really important is the protein itself, okay? So not RNA, because it doesn't mean that you have 10 RNA molecules, that you have 10 proteins, let's say, okay? So they said, and besides, proteins are the ones that do the function for cells, not RNA, not DNA. So, so they came up with a new science known as proteomics, which basically analyzes the total collection of proteins in a cell. Now, other uh, uh, biochemists said, you know what, what's really important is the uh, metabolites, that is the, the products of enzymatic reactions. So they came up with a science known as metabolomics. Anyway, anyhow, so it's a uh, long story. So the whole idea basically is that, that we, I want to focus on is uh, transcriptomics, okay? So the idea is now, instead of studying, uh, so genomics is basically studying the whole DNA, okay? Not a single gene, but I'm, I'm, I'm studying all genes at the same time. So with transcriptomics as a science, it's basically studying all messenger RNA molecules, not only a single messenger RNA molecule, okay? So this is how powerful technology is.
Same thing with uh, proteomics, is studying all proteins at the same time, and so on. So how can we study the expression of all genes at the same time? So here, what I'm going to do is talk about two technologies. Um, so, so the the technology you can read it on your own. So the technology is known as a DNA microarray. What does array mean? Array means like a sequence of uh, something, whatever that thing is. Masfufe, okay? In the Arabic, masfufe. So a microarray, a DNA microarray, is basically a, a, a masfufe of DNA molecules, okay? And it's really small. This microarray is really, really small. And this is how it looks like. Right here is how it looks like. So this is, it's called a chip as well. Okay, so the idea is that this here, this square right here, contains in fact thousands of spots that look like this. So if you look at a single section, you have an array right here of what? Of spots. Each spot contains a probe for a certain gene, okay? And actually, there are different molecules of probes or different, yeah, different probe molecules per spot of one particular gene. So right here, for example, you have a probe that is specific for actin, let's say. Next to it, you have a, another cluster, another spot, that contains a cluster of probe molecules for gene X. The one next to it is another gene and a third gene and so on. So how many genes do we have? We have about, again, 20,500 genes so far. That's what we know of. So we can have actually probes for all 20,000 genes right here, arrayed on this little chip right here. Amazing, huh? And this is what we do. We And the probe, by the way, is not labeled, okay? In this case, it's not labeled. But this is what we do. This is um, one DNA uh, microarray. But in this case, we're using great reactivity, which uh, we don't use anymore, okay? But I hope that you will get the idea. The thing is, is that for each spot, contains probes for a certain gene. Now we take, we isolate all messenger RNA molecules, okay? Then we convert these messenger RNA molecules to complementary DNA and we label these cDNA molecules. Okay, so all cDNA molecules are labeled. So for one particular gene, if I have 100 messenger RNA molecules, I'm gonna have 100 cDNA molecules. If I have 1,000, then mRNA molecules of another gene, I'm going to have 1,000 cDNA molecules of that gene. And then what we do is that we throw in the all of these cDNA molecules onto the microarray. And each cDNA would bind to its probe. Okay? So you will have here on this part 1,000 cDNA molecules bound to this spot. The one next to it, you have maybe, I don't know, 50, I don't know, 10, something. There is little signal right here. The one next to it, there is no signal. So what does that mean that there is no signal? The, the meaning that there is no signal indicates that there is no cDNA, which means that initially there is no messenger RNA. Which means what? It means that the gene is not expressed. Okay? So by comparing this spot, the intensity of signal on this spot versus this spot versus that spot, you would say that this gene is highly expressed versus this versus that where there is no expression whatsoever. So right here, by looking at all of these spots, what can we tell? we can tell the relative expression of genes 
at a certain time point by looking at the intensity of all of these signals. So we know what genes are expressed and we know what genes are not expressed and we know relatively, this BN, how much of a gene is expressed. Great. But scientists like to measure things, okay? They don't like to do things relatively, okay? And this BN, it's not accurate. They, they like to measure things. So, and they, they don't like radioactivity, of course, because it's harmful. So they said, you know what? We're going to do fluorescence. Not only that, we're going to do comparative expression at the same time. Meaning what? That I want to compare the expression of all genes in two samples at the same time. And these two samples can be um, like controlled versus cancer. You can do it uh, control. You should always have a control. Control uh, with cells, uh, control cells versus cells exposed to a certain drug, whatever that drug is, and so on. Cells, uh, control cells versus cells exposed to a certain toxin. Okay, and you want to see what genes, uh, uh, the, you want to see the expression of genes uh, based on uh, as a that uh, you want to see changes in gene expression as a result of exposure of cells to a certain drug. Okay, and that tells you what genes are important for eliminating this drug, for example, or metabolizing this drug. How do cells handle the presence of a certain drug or toxin? If you compare normal versus cancer, then you can pinpoint, you can decide which genes are important for the transformation of controlled healthy cells, normal cells to cancer cells, okay? Now, here's the idea. What we do is that we have two samples. We isolate the messenger RNA. We convert messenger RNA to cDNA, and we label the cDNA molecules. But this time, we don't use radioactivity. We use fluorescence. Now for sample one, we label all cDNA molecules with, let's say, red fluorescence. And for sample two, we label all cDNA molecules with green fluorescence. Then we combine them both and we add them to the microarray. Now every cDNA would bind to its probe, right? And there is sort of competition between the red cDNA molecules and the green cDNA molecules. If they, if the, the gene, if gene expression is not different in these two different conditions, it means that the number of messenger RNA of, in both samples would be the same for this particular gene. Meaning that the amount or the number of cDNA molecules in both samples would also be the same, which means that they would bind equally to a certain spot, right? And each spot would generate equal amount of red fluorescence and green fluorescence. Now, let's say that uh, sample one is the control, that is the, the cells that are not exposed to a certain drug or cells that are normal, okay? And sample two is basically cells uh, that are exposed to a drug or cancer cells, for example. Okay, and let's say that you have a gene uh, whose expression is now increased in sample two. This means that on any particular spot, you will have more green fluorescence than red fluorescence, right? Let's say the opposite happens. That is, you have expression of gene in healthy cells, but then when they are exposed uh, to a drug or uh, they, uh, they become cancerous, this ex the expression of this particular gene is decreased meaning that you will have more red fluorescence than green fluorescence, and you will have on any particular spot more red fluorescence emitted, okay, than green fluorescence. So let's say that the gene is not expressed whatsoever in sample one or sample two. It means that there will be no 
signal appearing whatsoever. Okay, so here are the results and these are the probabilities. Um, you can um, illustrate it um, as these colors right here. And these are all computer generated, by the way. So a white spot, or it can be a black spot, by the way, it means that there is no, that the gene is not expressed, meaning that there is no messenger RNA in either sample, no cDNA, of course, and as a result, nothing would bind to this particular spot, so there's no signal. So uh, we, we illustrate it as black spot or uh, white spot, meaning that there is no signal. Let's say that sample one contains more messenger RNA than sample two. It means that it contains, uh, we will have more cDNA of that particular gene in sample one than sample two. And you will have red fluorescence, okay? And you would get something like this in these spots right here. Let's say that sample two has more messenger RNA slash cDNA than sample one, so you will have more green fluorescence than red fluorescence. So let's say that expression is equal. It means that there will be equal equal uh, amount of fluorescence emitted from any particular spot, and the computer gives us a yellow color. Okay, so these are the probabilities. So by doing this, we can uh, relatively as well uh, um, see the changes in, in, in expression of all genes at the same time, which is quite amazing, right? So this is an example, and you can read this example. These are bacterial cells grown in glucose or, or uh, grown in ethanol, saccharine, al um, so this is uh, this is what we do. We isolate the messenger RNA. We convert it to cDNA. We mix them. We add them to the array, and these are the probabilities. And you would get something like this. Okay, so you can read this again on your own. The trick here is not only doing the experiment itself; it's rather the bioinformatics. That is the analysis of results no person would be able to look at all expression of all 20,000 genes and and looking at all of these spots and analyzing these spots so it's all computer generated and the computer not only uh, not only uh, can do two samples no it can do hundreds and thousands of samples okay so we have a lot of data points now, here what, what computers do, do as well is that they cluster samples together. That is, what they do is, let's say for cancer, okay? So cancer is, is a good example. Let's say that we have a three, uh, three patients with liver cancer, okay? Now, it does not mean that all these liver cancers are exactly the same. They are different, okay? They can, they may contain different mutations. They behave differently. Um, uh, one liver cancer may respond to treatment, and another would not respond. Why? Well, we don't know. But now we we do know because gene expression determines that. Okay. So you, you, one cancer would be more aggressive than the other even though both are liver cancers. Again, why? Because their molecular profile, and this is the word, because their molecular profile is different. Okay, and that's what determines the behavior of cancer cells or the behavior in cells in, of cells in general. Okay, so what computers do is that, is that they, they group uh, diseases that look similar histologically or by name into different groups according to their molecular profile. Okay, so this is uh, what is done, what can be done for three samples. The sample one, sample two, sample three, okay? So this is the expression of uh, nine genes in, the, in these three samples. And we use the same control, let's say the same normal cells. Now you look at sample one, 
you see that um, uh, let's say that red means overexpression, green means uh, down regulation uh, of a particular gene. Yellow indicates equal expression and black indicates no expression of this gene whatsoever. So look at a sample. Uh, gene number one is overexpressed in sample one. Uh, gene number two, equal expression between the cancer cell and the normal cell. Uh, gene number three, there is down regulation. There is less expression of this particular gene in cancer versus normal and so on and so forth. Now we look at sample two. The pattern is a bit different, quite different actually. Look at sample three. Well, expression is sort of similar to that of sample one, but there are differences as well. So what the computer does is that it groups all of these data points and it clusters samples. So it tells me that, wait a second, samples one and three look similar compared to sample two. And I and, and the computer uses the computer uses these genes, gene one five, three, eight, seven, six. Well, how about the other genes? The computer disregards these genes. Why? Like, like number nine, for example. Nine is not taken. Why? Because the gene is not expressed. Okay? Meaning that it is not informative. It is not expressed in any of these samples, which means that it is not informative, meaning that it does not give us information. So the computer does says, you know what, it's not informative. It doesn't give me any information. I'm going to disregard it. Okay. How about gene number four? It's not there in the list. Why? Because there's equal expression um, in samples one, two, and three between the cancer and the normal cells. Okay. That, that means that this gene most probably is not important in the process of of carcinogenesis or in the process of transforming cells from normal to cancer okay so the computer said you know what it's not really important so i'm gonna disregard it so the computer said wait let's look at genes uh, expression of genes one and five they are overexpressed in samples one and three and look at genes versus um, equal um, down regulation in cancer versus normal for sample two, uh, there is no expression for gene number uh, five in, in sample two. Uh, let's look at three, eight, and seven. Same expression pattern in samples one and three. Okay, and it's different in sample two. So it tells me that wait, it groups one and three together, saying that the molecular profile of these two genes is quite similar versus number two that gives us indication for how we should handle these different cancers these different uh, patients how what treatment we should give them um, how we should follow up uh, with these patients and so on okay so i'll show you an example right here this is uh, a real example for breast cancer all these samples were taken from all of these patients and these are the relevant the relevant the important genes that are considered uh, green is down regulation uh, red indicates overexpression now look at the clustering that the computer does in here it puts these patients together and these are the genes that are important Look at this. Uh, for these genes, there's overexpression in these patients versus and in, in, uh, down regulation of these genes in the same patients. Look at the pattern for these patients right here. It's the opposite. There is down regulation in cancer for these particular genes, and there is up regulation of these genes uh, in these patients. So the, the pattern of gene expression is different among these patients. By going back to the clinical file to look at these patients 
in more um, in more details and 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 more thoroughly uh, clinicians and scientists found that these patients have poor outcome that is their cancer is more aggressive okay than these patients these patients have good outcome meaning that their cancers are not really that aggressive and they are and these cancers are treatable they can be uh, treated gently whereas for these patients with a poor outcome uh, more aggressive therapy is needed more extensive therapy is needed and this is all based on gene expression so the next time patients come into the clinic with cancer whatever cancer is what uh, cl scientists and clinicians do is that they look at gene expression and they see do they do do these tumors have this pattern of expression of that or that pattern of expression so they can determine what kind of therapy is needed for these patients okay so they can do prediction analysis and this is what actually is done these days that is uh, women with breast cancer uh, they they can do gene analysis okay uh, uh, using a microarray, except that they do, they do not do 20,000 genes, they rather do a uh, limited number of genes, like 70 genes, for example, because these are the genes that are important, the, only the 70 genes. And they, based on that, they can determine what kind of treatment they should give these patients, by the way. So um, this is sort of like an older technology. So let's go into something more uh, advanced. Remember how we said we can do sequencing um, nowadays in like 24 hours for all genes? Well, scientists have said, well, why don't we do sequencing for RNA and use it for, for quantitative purposes? Okay, so they said, this is what we will do. We will take all messenger RNA molecules from a sample Okay. And then we will convert them to cDNA again, using reverse transcriptase. So remember that if I have four molecules of messenger RNA, I'm going to have four molecules of cDNA. If I have one, then I have one. If I have two, then I have two. And then sequencing is done for all of these cDNA molecules. Not only that we know what the sequence of the cDNAs is, Okay, let me say this again. Not only that we can tell the sequences of all messenger or of all cDNA molecules, we can also know how many sequences there are or how many times these cDNA molecules um, are sequenced. And that gives us an indication for the quantity of cDNA. I'll say that again not only that we can tell what the sequence of the cDNA molecules is, we can also tell how many times the cDNA molecules are sequenced and that gives us an indication for the quantity of the messenger RNA. So the blue messenger RNA, or sorry, the blue seed, oh, goodness, I'm uh, colorblind. The yellow uh, cDNA molecules are sequenced more often than the blue cDNA molecules, which are sequenced more often than the red cDNA molecules. So that tells me that there is more yellow cDNA or yellow messenger RNA than blue and more blue than red. And that tells me that the gene that expresses the, the yellow messenger RNA is more active than the blue gene and the blue gene is more active than the red gene. So we can know how many, we can know the relative amount of each uh, cDNA or messenger RNA and that tells me something about how active genes are. Okay now, so What's the difference between RNA sequencing and microarrays? Well, with the RNA-seq, 
that's how we say it rna seq it can be used to characterize okay to uh, uh in addition to knowing uh, the quantities of cdna the relative quantities of cdna or messenger rna we can know the sequence as well okay that's important why because now we can identify novel transcripts now remember with microarrays I know what the probes are that are placed in every single spot. So I already have knowledge about the sequence of the uh, genes. But with RNA-seq, I'm sequencing everything. The messenger RNAs, mo RNA molecules that I know and the others that I don't. And that uh, allows me to identify novel transcripts, novel genes. Okay. And that what was actually done about six years ago when scientists sequenced all messenger, all RNA molecules, not messenger RNA, all RNA molecules. And when they went back to the database of the Human Genome Project at the DNA sequence, they said, oh my God. So, not, so it's not only that 2% of the human genome is important, that is protein coding. 70% of the human genome is actually transcribed. And that was like a bombshell to all scientists, okay? Now, what do these RNA molecules do that are transcribed? Uh, they don't know. And this is, and, and uh, believe it or not, even enhancers, parts of enhancers and parts of promoters can be transcribed as well this is something huge by the way but forget it that i said that okay so um so promoters are not transcribed that's between you and me for the ex for exam purposes now now we don't know what this means by the way and the fact that we cannot even handle two percent of the human genome that that is protein coding and we have now 70% of the human genome that is transcribed. This is huge. I mean, we, we hardly can handle 2%. How can we handle 70%? And this is why I say that the future of this field, of this exciting field, is in bioinformatics and prediction analysis. Okay? Because we cannot handle all of, all of these data. So... Back to uh, molecular biology. So we can identify novel transcripts. That's one. Number two, we can identify splicing variants. We cannot do that with microarray. We can hardly do that with microarray, but, but with the RNA-seq, we can identify splicing variants of the same gene. Okay, And we can also provide the expression levels of known transcripts. This is well known. Okay, So, but, so microarrays are really limited to in, in detecting transcripts that corresponding to known genomic sequences. Now, this is part of uh, molecular biology and its techniques, and this is what the future is all about.